Hi, I'm pleased to welcome you to this People Before Profit Rally. The event is to close the Arise, an online festival of Labour's left ideas and supported by a range of groups and publications, including Labour Assembly Against Austerity and our media partner, Labour Outlook. My name is Laura McAlpine. I was the Labour candidate for my hometown, Harlow, in Essex in 2019. And I'm really excited to be here today. We are going through a major crisis and a need to put forward ways to transform our world and put people, health and planet first. We know the Tories will always put the interests of the 1% first. They have failed again and again during this crisis and we will not let them off the hook. But we will fight back as a united left and a united movement and put forward the proposals for real change. As part of that, Labour Assembly are today launching a people's post pandemic plan that you can sign up for using the links provided. Arise is a celebration of values of socialism, of peace, internationalism, solidarity, and unity and I am delighted to be a part of it today and over 10,000 people have been a part of this so far. Due to an amazing level of interest as well as the Zoom webinar we are streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page and across various Facebook pages. So I want to introduce you to our first speaker first and that is the fantastic Belle Ribeiro Addy. Thanks Belle. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting um, me today. Um, I say this every time we meet, but we do meet at an important time and uh, we have to be clear about what we're, we're facing. And that's the fact that we've already been through 10 years of, of Tory austerity and that's been too much. Uh, they've ever seen the decimation of our public services, a divided society, a rise in hate crime and violence. And it's important that Labour um, as a party remains a party of you know a virtuous circle of investment in people in jobs in progressive taxation and we can see that the Tories actually a party of a vicious cycle of tax breaks for the rich and cuts for everyone else their answer to any sort of crisis is to protect their own interests first and we've seen that even within the handling of the the coronavirus pandemic now it's left us staring at the worst economic shock of any OECD country um, and one of, if not the highest, coronavirus death toll in Europe. We were slow to realise the threat posed by the virus, slow to acquire life-saving equipment, slow to take action to safeguard human life against the virus, and as well as their hesitation to adopt pol bold policies and follow the example of other countries um, during a public health crisis, they've just overall left us worse off. Now, we have a level of deaths that are officially at 45,000 at the moment, whilst they're projected at over 60,000. If we contrast that with a country like New Zealand, um, which is not too dissimilar from our own, but they've only had 22 deaths. Now I want everyone to think about 22 deaths as compared to over 60,000 deaths, just because of the poor choices that this government has made. And we you know because there've been a, a number of things like a poor, poor reaction to testing, even things such as PPE. And the, the failure to get PPE to people as quickly as possible is a, a clear example of putting profit uh, over people. Because quite frankly, what we saw was um, the government, as they love to do, this particular government, handing out all of these, these contracts to private companies, uh, rather than looking, um, looking well, within, within the country as well in particular, and trying, them trying to get the cheapest deal and, and leaving people waiting for ages and ages just because of the way in which they have decided to privatise certain sections of the NHS. Now, 10 years of austerity left us in a very bad shape anyway, in terms of our health service and the amount of investment that we been put in our health service, but also the protection for the most vulnerable people. So we now see that um, BAME people are more likely um, who are disproportionately likely to die from the virus. And all of these things are due to the inequalities that exist in our society, the inequalities that remain unchecked, and all of those, those things um, that have been ignored for, for a number of years. And in, in, in conjunction with that, we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and people talking quite clearly about needing racial inequality, not just 
uh, from, from from state state violence, state sanctioned violence with the police, but but all across from education to employment and all of these different issues that have exacerbated what we're seeing now. Now, I, I worry about this because um, there do certain, seem to be some issues amongst the left at times when we talk about certain things. And I heard somebody in this particular period say, you know, we need to be really careful about, um, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter and how we say it, because we've just come out of a general election where we've lost um, a lot of votes in white working class communities. And these it, you know, people might feel like we're not we're not including them and we're not thinking about what their issues are. And this has been a major issue going on for some time now with and, and this is what's happened. This is why more people are disproportionately in the, in the BAME community dying from the coronavirus. With as much as 80% of people, black people, and I mean politically black, um, the people living in uh, the poorest areas of the country, we are working class people and there shouldn't be a division. We shouldn't be talking about the working class and black communities because black communities are working class. It's very, very important that we, we move that forward, that idea forward particularly when it comes to winning um, the next general election. Uh, and I, I think about why people make that distinction. And, and, and it's, it's, it's something as old as time itself. It's divide and rule. Divide our communities, divide that strength amongst us. And, you know, it makes it difficult for us to, to, to push forward, to push our movement forward. So we shouldn't have those divisions at all. And you hear it talked about and, and hear it sustained. And again, even amongst the left, when it comes to people saying we need to talk about issues of immigration in society and how immigration, you know, people in different parts of the country might have issues. We need to listen to their issues. Well, you know what I hear when I listen to their issues? I hear that, you know, putting across the very blatant bigots aside, you hear people very clearly talking about housing, talking about healthcare, talking about education and talking about how they don't have access to these things in the way they want to. And talking about how they've been told the reason why they don't have access to these things is because of migrants or you know other black people taking stuff away from them. Um, and it's, it, it's classic divide and rule. And surely if we were to focus on those societal issues, you'd find that people, unless of course they are just still blatantly racist, don't have that much of an issue with black and brown people on their streets. They just, excuse me, they just don't. It's just, it's just a matter of a fact of what the government keeps putting them through and then keep selling them a story that somebody else is to blame. And I say it's important when it comes to, 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 to the general election, because I'm looking at how the Black Lives Matter movement is starting to be treated and the divisions that people want to create amongst society. And I keep thinking to myself um, that, you know, the, the black community remain one of the most loyal voting groups uh, for the Labour Party. And we need to be very, very aware of that and very careful of that and not think to ourselves that they will just naturally vote Labour because we had another very low, loyal voting group and they were actually the Scottish people. People of Scotland used to vote for Labour again and again, no questions asked. And we saw what they did in the 2015 election. Now I put that, that point because it, it, it links in quite well because we were told that the reason why they didn't vote um, well, we lost that 2015 election because we weren't tough enough on immigration. And then we went down a road of attempting to go um, go harder on immigration and to do things that are really not socialist, not what we are meant to be as a Labour Party. And that didn't win us any elections either. And to be quite frank, if we are going to win our next session, we need to stand firm on our socialist policies and move forward in, in that way and not go down this idea of divide and rule, not go down this idea, which we're actually just entrenches racism in our society that is what we've been taught again and again that in order if, if you talk about black people in a particular context if you talk about anybody in a context of equalities you're taking something from someone else that is a falsehood that we just need to remove entirely talking about a disadvantaged group does not take away from someone else we are all working class and we all need to fight together and another issue that i can see that they're already going to um, just just push to the side is, is the issue of the environment. So from their response so far, um, you wouldn't know that we were actually facing any sort of climate emergency. Uh, Three billion of green spending that has been earmarked for the environmental project this year, a tenth of what we would need to meet um, the net zero carbon target in time. Um, the government has handed out more money to aviation, automotive and oil industries. They're doling out loans without binding commitments to reduce emissions or even keep workers on the payroll. And as we see that 
for what they're doing with the disgraceful treatment of the British Airways uh, workers. Now, we are, as I said before, heading, heading into the worst recession that we have ever seen. And, but we know what happens after a bad recession, years of austerity, um, years of, of continuing to, to push uh, the working classes um, to, to, to their limit. And we can't allow that to happen. We have to be unified in every single sense of the word. Um, I'm really pleased to see that particularly during this process, more and more people have joined trade unions. Um, we are facing major, major job losses, and that's going to be important. The strength of the unions, the strength of our movements moving forward. Um, we need to keep working together across the left, um, the le Labour and all progressive movements to insist that we have no return to business as usual. We have an opportunity now to move things forward for the better, and we need to seize that as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Thanks, Bella. That was absolutely excellent. Um, yeah, classic uh, Tories, yeah, divide and rule, pitching working class communities against another uh, working class community. Um, thank you. That was absolutely excellent. So next we've got John Trickett on. Um, he's having a birthday bar barbecue today. So um, his sausages are burning apparently in the garden. So <laughs> yeah, he's up now. Thanks a lot. Not too much. I'm afraid the sausages are probably burnt, but never mind. It's great to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me and so many of you to come online on a Saturday afternoon. Um, clearly, uh, we've gone through difficult times. Uh, it's been uh, difficult, I think, to recover emotionally from the election and then the change of the leadership. But the left knows one thing, and that's to, how to fight, how to struggle, and how to continue to um, press forward with our ideas and our policies. Only the left, it seems to me, can find a way out of the crisis which we face, which is now an extremely complicated crisis uh, indeed. Um, but, and what I want to do is just talk about austerity, the background to the current uh, COVID crisis, and then I'm, I'm gonna give you some figures. Some of you would have seen me giving some slides before. Don't switch off, these are new slides. I'm gonna give you a test at the end to see if you spotted the difference. But let me just respond straight away to Bell. Of course, we must never allow the right wing, whether in our movement or anywhere else in our society, to divide our class. Our class, in all its diversity, suffers from most of the same material problems, though clearly uh, some people have additional problems and forms of oppression to confront, whether it's sexuality, whether it's gender, or whether it's ethnicity, and so on and so forth. And um, I always remember back to the George Osborne days, he attempted to divide the working class into strivers and skivers as though the poor people were skiving. And I'm afraid some of that language is being echoed um, within our movement at the moment. And we have to reject that. People in poverty, it is not their fault that they're in poverty. It's a result of a system which is simply not working uh, for uh, working people as a whole. I'm going to give you a presentation now. I'm hoping that we can make this work. Oh, yeah, well, so far, away, it's looking quite good. And what I want to talk about is the background to the current situation. And let me just um, uh, move that out of the way so I can read my own uh, thing. So um, class and austerity, who will pay for the COVID crisis? And I think we on the left have a clear idea exactly how we should respond to this uh, problem. But I want to just go back a little while first to show you what happened the last, in the last crisis in the years since. Now, uh, the cost of the banking bailout, this is a slide from the Sun newspaper, by the way. I'm sorry to use it, but it illustrates a point. Uh, that the National Audit Office estimated that the cost of the banking crisis was £1.2 trillion. Remember that figure, £1.2 trillion. But by the time, that was the cost of the banking bailout. But by the time we got to 2017, almost all of that bailout had been paid off. There was 58 billion pound left. Most of that's gone now. But it was paid off by the banking sector itself in repaying loans, in the government selling off shares and in uh, dividends, which were paid to the governments as well. So my point is this. If a bailout of 1.2 trillion was paid off by the banking sector by various different means. What was the austerity all about over the last 10 to 12 years? And what it was, we're gonna to go to the next slide. Uh, before we do though, I want to just put into scale the cost of the uh, current crisis 
It's a quarter of the cost of the banking bailout, probably a little bit more since the Chancellor's statement on, on a Thursday. But uh, the banking crisis, 1.2 trillion, four times more than the most recent estimate of the cost of COVID uh, today. I think that's just gets the thing in scale in our minds when we just go through the next few slides. Here we go. What I've done is I've looked uh, because austerity, which was ostensibly about um, all of us being in this together, actually was a war by the ruling, a class war by the ruling class against the rest of the population. And I want to try to prove that assertion in two or three slides. The first slide shows the value, on, the, the, the value of the London Stock Exchange. In quarter one, 2009, it was worth 2.6 trillion. By the time we got to quarter one last year, I don't want to take quarter one this year because of the, cri the COVID crisis, it increased to 4 trillion. So whilst the working class, all working people, were suffering uh, from austerity, as we'll see in a moment, the big corporations were larding it in with increasingly large amounts of money. And more than that, we can see in the next uh, slide, the shareholders were also, uh, so that was the value of the companies. What this slide shows you is the dividends to companies on the London Stock Exchange in billions of pounds. Even in the first year, 2009, in the middle of dealing with the crisis, 60 billion pounds was paid to, share, paid to shareholders out of London Stock Exchange companies. By the time we get to last year, ignore the blue and yellow figures, it's just two different kinds of dividend. It was just a, a very small amount short of 100 billion pounds in dividends paid to shareholders and I think it puts in scale a little bit the 300 billion cost of the COVID crisis. If 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 the uh, shareholders can be paid 100 billion in a single year, you'll see that hundreds of billions have been pound been paid during the austerity years. Let's keep moving to the next slide. This shows the uh, just if you're interested, which companies paid the largest amount of dividends. Well. In the top 10 uh, largest dividend paying companies, four were privatized public utilities, four were firms based in the city of London, one was a tobacco company and one was Tesco's. I'm not going to get this finished in a minute, but I'll try to go as fast as I can. Keep going. Now, uh, the richest thousand people increased their wealth by 538 billion pounds in the same period. Next slide. Sorry to rush this slightly. What this slide here shows you is the cost to everybody who works for a living, uh, whether by uh, hand or by brain, by uh, manual or white collar, blue collar and so on. There are 33 million people who work in our country. Our combined spending power was held down by nearly 400 billion pounds over that period of time while the richest people were getting richer and the companies were getting uh, increasingly wealthy. Let's keep on going as fast as we can. I'm under pressure. So I think, look, how do we respond to COVID? First of all, it's a large amount of money, um, but it, it, it's not by the scale of uh, what, what has happened to the wealth in our country. The question which we have to ask the Labour leadership is the following. Who will pay for COVID? It ought not to be working people as it was for the banking crash, as we've just seen. And there must be no return by the Labour leadership to austerity light. I thought the idea that we should uh, support austerity, but just say it was going a bit too far and a bit too fast was a mistake uh, in the five years between 2010 and 2015. We have to resist austerity. We have to end inequality in our society. And we have to build a Labour movement which is rooted in working class communities in all of their diversity. In the whole diversity of the working class, we need to rebuild our, our movement based on those things. Last slide, I'm going to finish very quickly. If you want to know more about those ideas, we're discussing them regularly in Northern Discomfort. There's our email address if you want to write to me. With those few points then, I think it's clear that austerity, which uh, we faced over the last 12 years, was about a class war by the richest against the rest of us. And we must see no repetition of that, nor must we see the Labour leadership collaborating in some way with the tax on our communities and our public services 
in the coming austerity, which I've no doubt Boris Johnson is planning even as we talk this afternoon. And thank you very much to, for listening to me. I'm off back to my burnt sausages in a moment or two. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, John. Really great. Enjoy your barbecue. So next up, we have the fantastic Dr. Mona Kamal. And uh, Dr. Mona Kamal is from Keep Our NHS Public. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name's Mona. I'm an, I'm an NHS worker. I'm a doctor working in mental health. Um, and as someone who's been involved in NHS campaigning for a number of years uh, with Keep Our NHS Public and with People's Assembly Against Austerity, you know, speaking about the impact that defunding uh, and privatisation has had on our ability to provide good quality patient care. It's actually been really hard um, to, to witness this crisis and the way in which our health service, service has really struggled to meet the demands of the, of the pandemic. You know, the, the UK has the highest death rate in the world when you adjust it for population. Um, and it feels that this figure has really finally laid bare um, the impact of the campaign uh, against the NHS and to turn it into a casualty of austerity. And it's the 64,000 who've died from this virus and their loved ones who've, who've had to pay the price. Um, and, you know, of, of course, there have been failures in handling the pandemic itself. Um, we know mortality rates could have been cut in half if we just locked down one week earlier. You know, if Boris Johnson hadn't taken the decision to ignore pandemic protocols and World Health Organization guidance to keep you know, business open as usual, half of those deaths could have been prevented. Um, but really, the, the root causes of this crisis and our failure to manage it, they stretch back through decades of defunding and, and sell-offs to the private sector. Um, and of course, attacks on NHS staff um, terms and conditions, um, which meant that this pandemic actually arrived at a moment when the NHS was arguably at its very weakest. Um, so the causes of the crisis link back to decisions to close a record 17,000 beds over the past 10 years, which meant we had to deal with this crisis with the lowest number of hospital beds on record since the creation of the NHS, um, and one of the lowest numbers of hospital beds per capita of any other European country. You know, and from, and I think from, from the start, um, our government has really tried to, you know, treat this crisis like a PR exercise, and they knew that they couldn't risk you know those those photos that we've become accustomed to of of uh patients lining hospital corridors waiting for beds um so they 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 took the decision to transfer thousands of patients from hospital um into care homes either without testing or sending them back to the care homes having tested positive um, and this allowed this, the, the, the virus to spread amongst an extremely vulnerable group of you know el elderly patients um, and it's resulted in the loss of 20,000 people in care homes. And I think this is a, the very best. It's just negligent. And it illustrates perfectly um, our prime minister's arrogance and deceitfulness for him to suggest that this was down to um, care homes not following protocol. Um, and I think the deaths of key workers as well, due to the lack of personal protective equipment, you know, years of austerity cuts left the emergency stockpiles um, that were required in the event of a pandemic to fall by 40%. So health workers who've died for lack of PPE, they did so because our government failed to act on the knowledge that they had that their cuts had resulted in these stockpiles either running dangerously low or going out of date. Um, and also they stretch back to, you know, to the decisions to totally gut and outsource our pathology services, meaning that we were never capable of the type of mass testing um, that countries like Korea and Germany were capable of. The failures link back to attacks on NHS staff terms and conditions and also our training opportunities, um, which means we came into this crisis um, dangerously understaffed, missing 44,000 nurses from our wards and missing 10,000 doctors from our wards. You know, and the warnings were there. You know, this is this is not you know, this is this does, hasn't come as a shock. The warnings were there that a fourteen percent pay cut um, for nurses in real terms, um, coupled with the scrapping of the NHS student bursary, would be a disaster for staff recruitment and retention. But the cuts went ahead anyway, despite the evidence that such understaffing would actually put patients at risk um, and make us struggle to keep our wards safe. So what we've seen basically is a catalogue of 
recent but chronic failures, so acute on chronic failures by the Conservative government, which have, have cost lives. And we have to ask how it is that whilst, you know, being fully aware that a decade of austerity and privatisation had left our health service unable to cope. They wasted valuable time, you know, willfully ignoring um, advice to lockdown and failing to test properly. Um, and the lifting of the lockdown prematurely, which is herd immunity in all but name, shows us that they haven't really learned the lessons at all. So, <coughs> so as NHS workers and, and, and campaigners within Keep Our NHS Public, we are creating an NHS workers charter that's a set of demands we're putting forward. Firstly, we need to be demanding not just an end, but a reversal of the decade of, of defunding that the NHS has suffered. You know, the harshest, longest sustained reduction of healthcare spending in the NHS's history um, as a percentage of GDP. Secondly, we need the reinstatement of the NHS student bursary. Scrapping it caused applications to study nursing to plummet, which was warned, um, and that's compounded the staffing shortage. So we need the NHS student bursary back. Uh, we need an end to the hostile environment in the NHS and the £600 annual surcharge that patients have to pay, you know, if they're not ordinarily resident in the UK. That, and, and it's, you know, we know it prevents patients from presenting in time to, to their doctors. Um, and, and, you know, we absolutely have to demand an end to the internal market in the NHS and an end to privatisation because it's done nothing but fragment the service and it's allowed private companies to, you know, to, to cherry pick the most lucrative um, of contracts, leaving a, you know, a defunded NHS to, to, to pick up the rest. You know, we know that when taxpayers' money is siphoned off from the NHS into the private sector, what we're doing is actually paying more for a less efficient service, a less comprehensive service as well. And, you know, and this outsourcing significantly undermines the, you know, pay and working conditions, sick pay, you know, causing, you know, our, our, our colleagues to go to statutory sick, sick pay minimums during this crisis. Um, that's as a result of outsourcing and because of the fact they're not NHS employees anymore. You know, we have to put our patients' welfare and the welfare of NHS staff at the centre of what we do and not profit making. Um, and, and finally, I think we have to address the discriminatory um, unequal divisions of labour that exist within the workforce of the NHS, which means that you know, our BAME colleagues are the ones that are more likely to be in the more um, riskier patient-facing jobs which has meant that they are, they've been, you know, without the protection that they needed, which has resulted in disproportionately higher um, mortality rates um, among BAME NHS workers. And, you know, we don't need, we, we don't need training and unconscious bias to, to, to address this. We need action to, to rectify why it is um, we have so little BAME colleagues in, in the more senior positions within the NHS. Um, and the applause has been has been lovely. It's been great. But, you know, it's practical support and solidarity that's needed now so that when the government attempts to pay for this crisis with yet more funding cuts to the service, you know, it, and, and, and affect patient care um, and, a, and a tax staff terms and conditions, there's a, a real united front of NHS workers and patients um, that are that are ready to oppose them so that it's not us that's paying for this crisis yet again. Thanks so much, Mona, for that. Absolutely excellent. Thank you so much. Next up, we have uh, the brilliant Claudia Webb, who's the MP for Leicester East. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you uh, so much. And it's an absolute pleasure to join such an inspiring range of comrades, uh, organisers and friends today. You know, the COVID-19 crisis is, of course, unprecedented, yet it's also shining a light on existing racial and class inequalities uh, of a global level as well, which have deepened after half a century of brutal, unrestrained neoliberal policies. You know, like many uh, residents of Leicester, I have been extremely concerned by the rate of increase in coronavirus cases in my home city. Leicester's diversity is of course its strength, yet we know that racial and class inequalities coupled with inadequate government support mean that working class people, migrants, people of African, Asian and minority ethnic communities are at greater risk of and exposure to COVID-19. You know, as my own constituency of Leicester East is one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse 
places in the UK and as a high level of in-work poverty, we disproportionately suffer uh, from these discrepancies. So the virus may not itself, uh, may not discriminate, but our economic and social system certainly does. And therefore I'm also uh, gravely concerned by recent reports of employer malpractice in Leicester's garments industry, which has endangered workers uh, during this pandemic. This has been an open secret for far too long and has been brought to official attention over many years. We have seen a government simply brush the issue under the carpet, allowed zero hour contracts and poor pay to flourish whilst rejecting every single recommendation uh, from a select committee report. This could have actually addressed the problem whilst the mainstream media, of course, sought to demonise uh, migrants as not worthy. This is important to understand that the combined power of the political elite, media and big business has created and sustained the disaster capitalism where our communities are collateral damage. And I think it's important to understand the conditions that led us to this position and situation in Leicester. When I was elected as a member of parliament, for Leicester East, ending poverty and workplace exploitation was amongst the key priorities that I wanted to address. I will not be intimidated by anyone seeking to silence me or, or, to, or seeking to silence my, my constituents either. There are an estimated 1,500 garment manufacturing businesses in Leicester alone, employing in excess of 10,000 people, the majority of whom are women from migrant communities. So a recent study, as you know, from the Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs found that over a six year period, a quarter of all UK, UK textile uh, factories caught failing to pay the minimum wage was based in Leicester, with some textile factories reportedly offering less than three pounds 50 an, an hour. That is scandalous and we need to call it out. With an online shopping boom and unsafe, unsafe cramped working conditions with a lack of personal protective equipment, this has created, in my view, a perfect storm uh, whereby uh, this whereby this is a factor in the rise in COVID-19 transmission rates. So that is, in a sense, is deplorable. Leicester's garment industry, of course, and, it's, and the crisis that it presents itself is actually just a microcosm of the global assault on workers' rights. We need to see this in both its local, national and international context. Many of the workers who approached me for help have an immigration status of no recourse to public funds, are ineligible to access statutory sick pay, and are employed by firms which have no union recognition, and where health and safety measures have not been implemented at all. So Leicester is home, of course, to many undocumented workers, and those with no recourse to public funds, for whom it is impossible to survive without attending work and often in unsafe conditions. The crisis has demonstrated the need for unionized, accountable workplaces that prioritize employee well-being uh, above all else. All workplaces, in my view, must adhere to health and safety measures and no one should be forced to work in unsafe conditions. The government must ensure that all of us, regardless of our immigration status, can afford to stay safe during the continued lockdown. We must celebrate all which the labor and trade union movement has fought for and won over many years, from fairer pay to weekends. Everything that makes the lives of workers tolerable has been won by generations of struggle. We cannot let this pass. Yet, oh, because over the last decade, trade unions have been under siege 
from the Conservatives. The government must prove, therefore, that it prioritises public health over private profit by beginning to take workers' rights seriously. Because over the last uh, decade, we've seen that, that change happen in a very dramatic way that has affected our community so very badly. That means we have to remove unfair and unnecessary restrictions on trade unions, allowing people to come together and speak up on issues that affect them at work. It also means that they must repeal the anti-trade union legislation, including the Trade Union Act of 2016, and create new rights and freedoms for trade unions to help them win a better deal for working people. A recent investigation undertaken of course, by the organisation Labour Behind the Label, found evidence that conditions in Leicester's factories, primarily producing for Boohoo, are putting workers at risk of COVID-19 infections and fatalities. Sales of fast fashion clothes made by suppliers in Leicester's have helped fuel a rapid growth that could reward as Boohoo bosses, including uh, b billionaires with bonuses of up to 150 million. Imagine that. And it's appalling that the exploited labour of residents of Leicester East in my constituency is helping um, helping to finance such, such extravagant corporate uh, salaries. The, this actually demonstrates the stark inequalities that exist in our society and it's, in, and it's absolutely proof that the obscene wealth of the of the billion of, of the billionaires is built on the exploitation of the working class. It's true, billionaires exist because the working class, including migrants, are exploited. We must end this. After this crisis, Leicester can no longer be known as the sweatshop of Europe. We must continue to demand, therefore, that the government proves that it prioritizes public health over private profit. Uh, by beginning to take workers' rights seriously. During this pandemic, I have been uh, reflecting. I've been reflecting on how much of the achievements of the labour and trade union movement have been cut away during the failed neoliberal project of the last half century. It's hard not to wonder how many of the workers that have tragically died due to exposure from the coronavirus could have been saved if recent governments actually focused on building up protections for workers rather than transferring the wealth they create to the super rich. A wealth, a wealth I'll, let, I'll end on this, a wealth tax to make billionaires pay their fair share could not come sooner than now. This virus has demonstrated that we have a moral duty, a moral duty to ensure that everyone across the UK is protected. The task ahead of us, therefore, is not only to defeat this virus, but to build, build a world free of the class and racial inequalities which have exacerbated its brutal impact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. Brilliant points made there. Um, and next up is the excellent um, Rebecca Long-Bailey. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much uh, for having me on today. We've already had some amazing speeches so far. Now, I'm sure we all gasped in horror when we saw the headlines months ago about herd immunity. And many of us feared that the government was choosing to opt for short-term economic protection over the protection of our lives, which should have been the most important priority. But eventually, they arguably realized the severity of the crisis and they moved into a lockdown. But as we know, it was well behind other countries and it wasn't a lockdown for everyone. Our essential workers, from bus drivers to health workers to lorry drivers, you name it, they went out every single day, putting their lives at risk with little to no protection in many cases. Health workers fighting for just the very basic PPE that they should have been entitled to. And for those non-essential workers, like many of my own constituents in Salford, many were still asked to go to work, many in warehouses, factories and building sites where social distancing was nigh on impossible, frightened to speak out for fear of losing their jobs. And then began the easing of the lockdown over the last few weeks to get the economy moving, or so we were told. 
And first we saw the school's debacle. There was no real plan. The guidance was changed over 41 times. We saw the demonization of trade unions for having the audacity to raise valid safety concerns and ask the government to work with them to develop measures and wide ranging support for pupils and staff. And of course, the government said that the need to return to school and to have a full reopening as quickly as they wanted to set out was to tackle the ever widening attainment gap. And there is an attainment gap, but they failed to realise that tackling the attainment gap was much more than just getting pupils back into the classroom. It was about entrenched inequality that had held so many back where your postcode and your parents' income determined the backdrop against which your hopes and dreams would be either realised or crushed. And you know, ironically, the government cared so much about tackling the attainment gap that they had to be dragged kicking and screaming weeks ago to even agree to fund free school meals over the summer holidays. And then we saw the government allow people who couldn't work from home to go back to work. You remember Boris Johnson and his go to work, don't go to work, use public transport, don't use public transport debacle. But workers were told to simply have a reasonable chat with their boss about safety concerns. And after 10 years of austerity, where the health and safety executive has been driven into the ground, the likelihood of any workplace receiving an inspection from a health and safety uh, executive person is nigh on close to zero. And then there were those who couldn't work at all, those who weren't supported, those who didn't have the right to sick pay if they got ill. Over three million people in the UK, from musicians to freelancers to new starters to businesses, who could access very little support and they couldn't afford to take out the business interruption loans that the government had rolled out. But as the Chancellor's economic statement set out earlier this week, what did they get? A meal deal. A meal deal. And whilst the Tories waxed lyrical about Rue's Beltian approaches to investment, nothing could have been further from the truth. And it's our job on the left to set out now exactly what needs to be done to restructure our economy in the interests of the many. On safety, we need nothing less than a zero COVID UK. We need to demand from government a clear strategy with local test, track, trace, find and isolate, safety within workplaces, proper resources for the HSE and trade unions have got to be at the heart of this plan. On economic recovery, we need a safety net that provides enough to live on, that tackles the damaging impact that universal credit has had on families across the UK. And we've got to be at the forefront in making the arguments for new policies such as universal basic income. We need detailed local industrial strategies with education guarantees for all to match the skills we need. And yes, we should be looking at supporting sectors and businesses to protect jobs. And we should be doing so in return for conditions, good treatment of workers, trade union access, carbon reduction and yes we should even be looking at taking equity stakes in large businesses who receive bailouts and finally we've got to have a proper green new deal with the investment to match what we saw set out by the chancellor this week was not a green recovery plan we need a real green new deal because it's the biggest economic opportunity that we've had in a generation to not only tackle climate change but to create good jobs and embed these new industries in a new economic culture. And that's why it's so important for us not to lose sight of the public ownership commitments that we made in the last general election. It wasn't just necessary to have these, to drive forward the huge levels of investment that we needed to see to meet a target of net zero by 2030. But it gave us the opportunity to redistribute wealth in our communities, to create ethical supply chains. So for example, when we talked about the creation of new wind farms, where the government would take a 51% stake, that gave us the opportunity to make sure that every business that contracted with that newly created company was a good business. It had trade union access, it treated its work as well. And we could also guarantee that the profits generated from that new wind farm, they wouldn't go into the pockets of shareholders. 
they go back to our communities where they belong. So finally, I just want to say this. If we don't use this moment to instigate economic change on a massive scale, it won't just be our recovery from the pandemic that will be in peril. It will be tackling climate change and it will be any shred of trust that we are trying to build in our community, that we've actually got the answers to the problems that they face. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Next up, we have Roger McKenzie, Unison Assistant General Secretary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. And um, can I can I start off my contribution um, by um, offering solidarity um, to Unison members in Tower Hamlets, who this week um, took industrial action um, because a Labour council, and I did say a Labour council decided that it's okay to dismiss an entire workforce and re-engage that workforce on worse terms and conditions. A workforce that's predominantly black, a workforce that's predominantly low paid anyway. There is no way that we should have any Labour Council anywhere in this country deciding that that's an okay thing to do. So I hope you all join me in offering solidarity um, to those brave workers who took industrial action um, this week. If we want to build trust with the working class, then we have to identify with what those working class people are going through. It's not rocket science, this. This is simple and straightforward. And they expect better um, from a Labour Party. The great Angela Davis said recently, that these are extraordinary times that we're living in. And they're absolutely extraordinary times when a government deliberately puts workers in harm's way, deliberately puts workers in the harm's way of this pandemic, where employers throughout the country decide that it's okay, not just to put workers in harm's way, but also to continue to treat them like they're something they've scraped off the bottom of their shoe, or that they'll, um, in, in, they'll insist that workers come in and brave the pandemic to go to work. We have so many workers right now who are still struggling to put bread on the table, still struggling to keep a roof over their heads, and they're looking for um, politicians, they're looking for a political party. And yes, they're looking for a trade union movement to, to stand up for them, to stand up for what's right, and to speak on their behalf, and to speak truth to power, and to speak the truth about the conditions that people are expected to work in. We have to be that voice in the workplace, and we have to be that voice in the communities. And it's no good wallowing in some kind of um, thing where we're thinking, well, we lost the general election and things are tough. Things have always been tough for the working class. Things have always been tough for the left in the Labour Party. Things have always been tough for the trade union movement. Damn it, that's why we have a Labour movement. That's why we've got a trade union movement. And that's why we have a Labour Party. And a Labour Party, true to its name, is one that's going to stand up for people. We have to turn these 2020s into the new roaring 20s. The 20s where we're not afraid to stand up and speak for socialism. We're not afraid to stand up and speak on behalf of people and speak for um, the speak against the things that are happening to our people right now. We can speak about all of these things as much as we want, though. What we all know is that this is a time for organizers. Organisers have to be out there organising in workplaces, organising in communities, making the case for socialism. Let me finish with this, comrades. You know, there's been a lot said recently about Black Lives Matters. And I think it's one of the most important movements that we've seen in many, many years. And why it's important is because people haven't waited for institutions um, to organise demonstrations. They haven't waited for institutions to get things done. People have got up and organised and done these things for themselves. We should take pride in that. We should take inspiration from that. 
And that's what the Labour Party needs to be identifying with, standing up for working class people, not apologising for who we are and standing up for socialism. Thanks so much for listening. Absolutely spot on. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. And we've also got Jeremy Corbyn coming on at one point as well. So please stick around. And next up, we've got Grace Blakely, economist and writer for the Tribune magazine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Hi, everyone. It is great to see so many friendly faces I haven't seen for a while. And it's great to see so many people uh, being on this call as well. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about how the so about, about how the left should be responding to the kind of uh, different approach that the government seems to have been taking to the economy um, over the course of this crisis. Now, obviously, all of us who've been involved in Labour Assembly Against Austerity for quite a while in, um, in campaigning against the cuts um, and in, in opposing austerity and the kind of horrific impact that it's, it's had on working class communities for the last 10 years, have gotten used to, to talking about, you know, the economy and government policy in a very particular way. We've been really focused on, rightly, demanding higher spending, demanding that the government steps in to, um, you know, provide adequate social security, support our health service, support our social care workers, uh, not just clap for them, but actually provide the funding that these people need. Um, to do their jobs properly. And obviously the fact that that funding hasn't been there has had a significant impact on our capacity to respond to this pandemic. So we're still very, very much living with the legacy of austerity and all the, um, all the kind of massive economic problems that it has created. And those problems were significant. It wasn't just that it made our public services and our infrastructure work less well. Um, it also uh, contributed to an economy that was very weak, um, a, a recovery that was barely even there. And we've had a, a, a decade of wage stagnation, the longest period of wage stagnation since the Napoleonic Wars, and also combined with that, a really significant stagnation in productivity, which is what's supposed to drive growth over the long term. So we went into this pandemic with a really, really weak economy, at least in part because of Tory austerity. Now, what's been quite interesting is how the government has responded to the pandemic, because obviously Boris Johnson has come in and he wants us to believe that, you know, he is a man of the people he's going to kind of respond to the changing nature of the Conservative Party's base by um, undertaking policies that are much more kind of populist, economically populist. Um, and Rishi Sunak has obviously been chosen as the man to kind of deliver this vision. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of kind of headline grabbing statements about the billions of pounds that are being spent in response to the coronavirus pandemic. But actually, when you look beneath the surface, what we're seeing from the government right now represents what it looks much more like corporate welfare than it does um, a package of measures that is designed to support the interests of working people. Now, I think it's really important for us to be able to understand the difference here because, you know, we've gotten very used to saying, right, the government needs to be spending more. It needs to be doing X, Y and Z. Uh, say, for example, you know, if we wanted a Green New Deal, we've often framed that around the government just needs to spend more money. But actually, it's always been the case that if that money is just going straight into the hands of, uh, of corporations um, and of, you know, the bankers um, and shareholders that, that um, run those corporations and support those corporations, that's not really the kind of um, socialist policies that we would really want to be supporting. Um, we need, you know, obviously the Green New Deal has always been associated with not just an argument for higher spending, but also um, a, a democratization of the economy. Um, so an increasing role for, you know, working people in all of our major economic institutions and also a socialization of ownership. So making sure that ownership isn't just concentrated in the hands of a small number of people. Now, what we've seen from the government, um, you know, in, in the budget, for example, um, on Wednesday and also in the in the budget that we had at the beginning of the year, what we've seen from the government is a lot of kind of headline grabbing figures, a lot of, you know, a billion pounds here, a billion pounds there. But really, all the government has been doing has been doing what it always does, which is to support the interests of capital, to support the interests of the small number of people who own all the resources in our society. Now, in the wake of the financial crisis, the best way to support the interests of capital and conversely to kind of keep workers down was to implement austerity. It just so happens that today we're living in a crisis where the best way to support the interests of capital is to shower big business and finance with huge amounts of government cash. 
Now, the question we have to ask ourselves then is how do we respond to this, right? Because we've developed a lot of messaging saying the government needs to spend more money, it needs to invest, it needs to support workers, and it is now going to say, we're doing all of this, you know, what more can you demand? Actually, we need to really push forward and push home the point that the power of the state is currently being used to support the interests of a tiny elite. And that means we're going to have to start calling out corruption and collusion between big business, finance and the state. And you can just see the way that this plays out by looking at the comparison between the, the amount of resources that um, this government is directing towards you know, friendly businesses and the, the real slowness that it has uh, reacted to other problems that largely affect working people. So, you know, why did it take Marcus Rashford to force the government to introduce these free school meals over the holidays? But it took Rishi Sunak about two minutes to announce that he was providing completely unlimited support for big businesses. Meanwhile, the Bank of England is creating huge amounts of money, even more money um, than, we've, uh, than what we've seen over the last kind of 10 years to keep the financial system and corporations afloat. And what do we know about what happens when the Bank of England creates money and pumps it into the financial system? It makes the rich richer. It increases wealth and income inequality. And that's something that we're going to be seeing more of now. It also has an impact on the housing market. One state of easing drives up house prices. So that means that it's just going to exacerbate the housing crisis that we're already seeing. You know, a lot of people went into this saying, oh, it'd be great because at least it will reduce house prices. Not if the Bank of England explicitly says we want to protect the wealth of the wealthy. So we're not going to let those prices fall. Again, this is the use of state power to support the interests of people who already have wealth and power. Thank and you. Meanwhile, as we've heard from all these previous, yeah, I'll just, I'll finish up now. Um, as we've heard all these, uh, all our previous amazing speakers, people are still dying. Um, and, you know, the state is not being used to, uh, you know, impose you know, tra uh, testing and tracking systems that would prevent that. Instead, the one big priority has been protecting the economy, protecting the revenues of big business and supporting the finance sector. So obviously for the left, the issue isn't for, our, for us isn't just state spending. It's in whose interests state spending is being used. And I think in response to that, we need to change what we're demanding and not just say more money, but actually say we need a democratization of the economy. We need to put working people at the heart of our decision-making processes. We need to demand a voice for working people in all of our economic and political institutions, That's not just demand a bigger state. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you, Grace. That was absolutely excellent. And um, next up, we have Matt Wilgris, who is the national organizer of um, Arise and Labour Assembly Against Austerity. Um, yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura. And um, thank you to all our amazing speakers and speakers to come. Um, I just wanted to take less than a minute, really, to say thank you to everyone who spoke today and over 60 people who spoke across over 15 sessions that we've had at Arise this year. Um, we have had over 10,000 people register in advance for different events and have reached over 100,000 people through the different events and have over 1,000 people watching today. Um, obviously, it was very strange to have to cancel the festival and make it online, but I think it has been a big success. I'd also like to just very quickly thank our volunteers, the various bands, Amy, Sean, Sam, Emily, Lee, George, and of course, Patrick, who does most of the promotion and facilitating of these events that a lot of you will know. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that we are currently discussing what we'll be doing next with Arise Festival. Um, and we will be having a series of political education events, both in real life and online over the next year, but also to just flag up a couple of things that we want people to get involved in. The first thing is we really want people to write and share our sister website, labouroutlook.org. You can also find that on social media at Labour Outlook. The second is that we really want people to get involved in supporting the excellent grassroots alliance slate for the NEC elections and uh, Comrade Laura McNeil for the youth place. So please get involved with that and follow the links that you'll see in the chat. Secondly, we want, as Laura's already mentioned, people to sign and share what we've called the post-pandemic people's plan, um, which we're launching today, which is about putting the fight for jobs and the fight for defending living standards at the centre of the economic alternative. And finally, if we were in a actual hall now, I would be shaking my buckets because um, 
paying for Zoom webinars, paying for Restream, paying for MailChimp and other things, as we've got a lot bigger, has got a lot more expensive. So please do click on the donate link, which will be coming around on the chat and give us £10 or what you can afford. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for everything that you do as well. Um, we're very, very lucky to have you. And next up is Maya Goodfellow. She's the author of Hostile Environment, and she's an absolutely brilliant campaigner. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that, and thanks for having me. Thank you to all of the people who've worked to put this event on as well. I think, um, you know, people using their time and often volunteers spending time putting together these events for us. It's really, really important to recognise the, the, the labour that goes into that. Um, so I've got only about five minutes, so I'm going to keep it relatively brief and I, I, I don't, I'm going to try to avoid um, repeating what has already been said. Um, and I suppose one of the things to sort of start by thinking about is the ways that the pandemic has showed us what is possible in terms of change, in terms of changing how the economy functions, but also how wedded to what we might call the economic status quo our government is. And so what I mean by that, I think one, one good example um, of, of exactly what I mean is that if we if we look at immigration detention, for instance, um, the government was forced because of lo lobbying by a number of campaign groups, including detention action, was forced to um, release a huge number of people from immigration detention because of the danger that they were in. You know, detaining people during a pandemic is evidently not desirable um, and it sort of shows that these people didn't need to be in detention in the first place and it really should encourage us to sort of question the logics of detention altogether and really push for a world a country in particular in which we don't have detention centers but the government is still detaining a few hundred people and they're continuing to defend that and so I think that shows us how wedded they are to some of the core ideas around their immigration policy but this really intersects with thinking about who is running those detention centers whereas who is making money out of those detention centers existing because we know that a number of them are run by private corporations and so I just wanted to um, spend a few minutes I suppose really thinking about what it means to center racism understanding racism in our understanding of the economy and so i a number of people have already spoken about this really really well so i guess i'm sort of echoing people like bell um but i guess i, I wanted to think about what where the narrative is at and how we could think about this in relation to racism broadly in britain and then specifically in relation to immigration and i think one of the the most important things that we've known prior to the pandemic that's really really been highlighted through the pandemic is that racism is not just about individual acts it's not just about people being racist and a few a few people within the country being racist and everyone else being fine. It is about understanding this is systemic. And so much of our media debate, so much of our political debate is spent thinking about whether something is pol a politician said is racist or not. And then that's debated for hours and hours on end when actually we should be thinking about this is systemic. And what I mean by systemic is the academic Ruth Wilson Gilmore uses this, this um, definition of racism, which I think is really, really important for us, particularly in this moment. And she defines racism specifically as the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And so what this means, firstly, is we know that racism is often, the way that racism is produced and perpetuated is often perfectly legal and acted by, by states. And it, it, that's what we mean when we're talking about as being institutional. But this part about vulnerability to premature death has been so clearly shown for us during the coronavirus pandemic in terms of who is being impacted. And I think the reason why I mention this is not only because we have scholars like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who we can look to, who've been working on this for decades, who've been working around prison abolition, who can really make us understand what is meant by the term defund the police that should not be dismissed as something that is not possible. Um, but it's also because actually the left broadly and the parts of the trade union movement have for too long thought of racism as something separate from the economy. Whereas actually it's central to how the economy functions and we need to be recognizing that as we're moving forward in any kind of post pandemic world must take racism seriously. And I think one of the good example of this um, is that when we're thinking about what has happened with the immigration narrative during the pandemic is there seems to be some kind of celebration that there's been some shift so um, people have recognized that key workers are actually people that the government was calling low skilled migrants. Um, prior to the pandemic, that these are people who are working in supermarkets, delivery drivers, working in hospitals, doctors, nurses, NHS porters, people who are doing the work that keeps society going. 
But I actually, in, on those grounds, people have been advocating for better rights for those people. And so one example of this is the immigration health surcharge, whereby health workers and care workers now eventually, once the government actually put this in place, will not have to pay for the immigration health surcharge. That seems like some positive movement, but I would actually question it and say that shouldn't be the limits. People shouldn't have to risk their lives um, saving the lives of British people. They shouldn't have to prove their economic contribution or their worth in order to have decent rights. And so what I mean by that is no one should have to pay for the immigration health surcharge, which is something that people have to, means people have to pay twice over for the NHS. They're already paying into their national insurance contributions and um, through their taxes. And so when we have this narrative about the key worker, and it sort of treats all other workers and all other people, whether you're a worker or not, all of the people who are migrants are sort of unimportant or people who aren't contributing in the right way, that then decides the rights people can access. And so I guess I just wanted to sort of end by thinking about the fact that when government talks about control in terms of immigration, they do not only mean stopping people from coming into the country. They mean that too. We only need to look at the borders of Europe to see what that means in terms of people trying to cross the Mediterranean. But they also mean controlling the terms um, on which people come into the country. So the rights they can access, how long they're able to be here for, the government have talked about um, short-term visas, which is already an issue, stopping people from having access to citizen citizenship routes, which has long been an issue. And so when we're thinking about exploitation, when we're thinking about rights, and when we're thinking about how our economy functions, we need to recognize that immigration controls are a way by which to make certain groups of people vulnerable to this premature death that I talked about earlier. And I just, the thing that I will end on is that thinking about, when we're thinking about um, how the economy functions and we're thinking about how where profits are made we also need to connect this to the UK's bordering processes because it is not only the bordering processes are now carried out in our public services by our doctors and nurses by land private landlords it's also the fact that this is a big money-making business hundreds of thousands of pounds are made off of um, immigration fees but also through these immigration processing centers that are run by private companies and I think one of the most important examples historically of this, to bring together thinking about Black Lives Matter in the UK and thinking about immigration enforcement in the UK is the case of Jimmy Mubenga. When we hear the cries um, from George Floyd of, I can't breathe, we need to remember that th that was the same thing that was reportedly said by Jimmy Mubenga as he was being restrained on a plane that sat on the tarmac in London before he was gonna be deported to Angola. And it is important to note that not only has there been no justice for Jimmy Mubenga and many, many others like Jimmy Mubenga, but that it was G4S guards who were the people who were restraining him, G4S guards who were the people who had um, 65 racist texts found on their phones, but they weren't submitted to the um, evidence because the when they were on, on trial for his murder, because it was said that this would prejudice the jury. And so when we are thinking about this intersection between profit making, between large corporations, between racism and between immigration, we should look at what happened with Jimmy Mubenga and we should learn that actually this is central to pushing for a more equal society. Ha at the center of that has to be pushing for migrants' rights regardless of that people's documentation and regardless of their status and pushing for anti-racism. And that does not only mean things like unconscious bias training. It means actually thinking about how racism is central to our economy and that and challenging that. But I'll end there. Thanks. Thank you so much. Brilliant contribution. Sorry to rush you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next up is um, Nadia Jama. She's the CLGA candidate for the NEC. Thank you. To at today's event. Um, Sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry. Um, yeah, so thank you, Laura and Arise, for inviting me to speak at today's event. It's a real honour to share um, this platform and to be in the company of so many comrades. So I'm Nadia Jarman. I'm one of the six NEC candidates that's been supported by the CLGA. The theme for today is um, people before profit, also known as socialism, right? You know, it struck me, actually, um, that our last two manifestos were the manuals for how that should be implemented, not just here in the UK, but globally. And it's our task now to fight for those policies, to, to defend them and to develop them, because they are the blueprint for a fairer and more equal and just society for all, where people really matter. 
the pandemic further highlighted the inequalities that have been allowed to fester under the Tories, who solely aim to support the 1% and big business as we know, with trickle down economics that just allows the billionaires to get richer and the rest of us poorer. And that can't continue. We can't allow big business to make a killing from the crisis. Any bailout shouldn't be for bosses and shareholders, but for ensuring that workers keep their jobs and livelihoods. Putting people first, not profits. Because when you truly put people before profit, you fully fund our NHS so you can provide a modern day, well-resourced service for people at their time and need. You fund an education service that is free to all with lifelong learning. People before profit means climate justice and countries like the UK and the US bearing the greatest responsibility for climate emergency rather than the global south who have already borne the biggest impact. When you put people before profit, you provide good, well-paid, unionised jobs and provide public services that benefit the community and not the shareholders. When you put people before profit, you have a social care system that really is a safety net and not the symbol of fear that it currently is, with its harsh and caring measures that also pit people against each other and where poverty is rife for whole sections of our society. When you put people before profit, you have an ethical, a he ethical uh, foreign policy that implements UK arms controls to prevent the aiding of wars and the persecution of people far from our land. A foreign policy that stands for solidarity and human rights, including the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. It's our job over the next four years to get this message out whilst working in our communities and our workplaces, explaining why our socialist policies are so important now more than ever after the global pandemic. We can't have socialism for the rich and austerity for the poor, where the corporations are given handouts while the workers suffer declining paying conditions and millions lose their jobs. When we put people first, as our last two manifestos did, that benefits everyone in our society. Putting people first means giving power to their lives and their communities. That goes for our party too. The Tories have millionaire donors. We have our members, our greatest asset and our power to organise. We need more opportunities to make a difference in the party, more of a say over our campaigning and our policies. And we have to resist the moves to, res to erode our party de democracy. Key decisions about policy and how our party works shouldn't be made by a handful of people in a committee room or a Zoom meeting. That's for our annual conference for our members to decide. Yeah. As a party and as a country, we can't go back to business as usual. There is another way, but we'll have to fight for it, fight for our radical socialist principles to ensure that we deliver a socialist Labour government and a society that's fair and equal for all solidarity. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you. I wish you all the best. We really need you. Thank you. Um, next up, we've got Ian Lavery. Ian, are you there? Oh, hello. Well, thanks very much to the organisers for this uh, event. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, but I've got to say, you know, it's the Durham Miners Gala uh, day today, and it was cancelled, obviously, because of COVID-19. And the spirit in which the Durham Miners Gala uh, is carried out is just absolutely phenomenal. It's a spirit we want to bring, you know, bring to the left of the Labour and Trade Union and movement. The spirit we want to build upon. We want to continue with the great history, the traditions and the cultures of the working class areas. With working class solidarity, everybody on this call will have been to the Durham Miners Dollar. And what it does is recharges your batteries of solidarity for another year until it can become refreshed. After getting drained with everything 
that's happening in politics. But isn't it fantastic walking behind those fantastic banners with the brilliant messages? Many of the messages uh, and everything that it stands for is being there for over a century and is more relevant now than ever before. Unity is strength, comrades. Unity is strength. And without it, we'll fail. Of that, that isn't any doubt. It's great, isn't it? Marching behind the bands, behind the banners, with comrades in struggle, with campaign groups, whether they be local campaign groups in the community, whether it be trade unions uh, in the workplace, whether it be people from your area, from different areas, from different regions, and from countries far and wide, all who gather because they're there for it, it solidarity of ordinary working people. You've got no idea how much I'm missing that, that very, very feeling. But it's great to be here at this Arise conference, of course. Well, we've got to look, I've, I've got to say that I agree totally with, with Roger McKenzie. And when Roger mentioned the fact, what's happening with some of these labour groups in this country, whereby in Tower Hamlets, for example, are using Tory legislation to smash, basically, smash people's rights. Now, this is the sort of thing that we need to put right. We've got the world to gain. And you know what? If people who are threatening to leave the party and people who are leaving the party and leaving us to try and meet these challenges could just reconsider and organise, mourn, don't, uh, sorry, don't mourn, but organise will be up for these challenges because we've got, listen, let me tell you, comrades, we've got a lot of problems, a lot of challenges ahead. And the, the issues facing this country are greater than they ever have been before. And that's why we need a solid, unified left. We've got a tackle this Johnson preacher. We really have. Why is it in a country like ours that more low-paid people on a low incomes, low income families are actually supporting the Tories. They're not actually supporting the Labour Party. Why have we got more my former minors in the Tory ranks than what we have in the Labour ranks? We need to be a party. We need to be a movement that reflects the people we represent. We need more key workers in the Commons. We need more BM members in the Commons. We need more disabled members in the Commons. We want community champions in the Commons fighting the cause. You know, again, Roger mentioned the fact that socialism, you know, didn't just begin when Jeremy was elected in 2015. It didn't just begin then. And by God, it, it didn't end when we uh, had the, the, the election of Keir Starmer. It's always been a struggle, man. We've had challenges after challenges since the party and since the trade union movement were formed. That's what it's about. It's called the struggle. It's not called the struggle for nothing. We've got a job to, 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 to unify. We've got a job to challenge the government. And we've got a job, I, I'm afraid to say, to ensure that we challenge the party in which uh, we're you know, proud to represent. We've got to challenge the, the direction what it, it appears to be heading uh, since the election of the new leader and deputy leader of the party. Because I'll tell you something, anybody who believes, by the way, that Boris Johnson will invest heavily in the NHS and they pay key workers magnificent pay increases, they're living in cloud cuckoo land, it ain't going to happen. And we need to be ready for the fight. There'll be a wholesale uh, attack on the NHS trying to get more private finance into the NHS and more privatisation right through the NHS and care homes. No doubt about that. And there'll not be any finances, not much in terms of what these key workers actually uh, deserve for bringing with through the pandemic. That'll be a huge attack on the public sector workers again. So, comrades, I think I'm getting the, the, the nerd that I've spoke for a lot, I've shouted. The, the message is this. Right, don't mourn, organize. We will put people before profit, but we need people to remain in the party. 
We need great comrades that's on this call to stick together, to meet the challenges which we are to face uh, out there in this very, very cruel world uh, as it is. And we need to fight for every single thing, everything we've ever, ever gained, by the way. Everything we've ever gained in this movement is because we've fought for it and campaigned for it. Once we've won something, we've had to fight and campaign to keep everything we've gained. And then you've got to fight and campaign to get better, to make progress. We've got a duty. We've got an absolute duty. There's too many people out there relying on people like you know, the left of our movement. And we've got to step up to the plate, be united, be forceful, and hold everyone to the, to the, to the fire. Thank yeah. you very much, comrades. Solidarity to everyone. Solidarity and spot on as usual. Thank you. Next up, guys, we've got Laura, Laura, Laura McNeil, Labour NEC Youth Rep. Cheers, Laura. Hi, thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone um, who went before. It's been really encouraging to hear everyone when well, we all should be at Durham, but we're still, uh, you know, talking about and fighting for our movement. It's really encouraging. Um, I just want to talk just a little bit about what kind of time we're at in politics and what socialists needs to be doing. So we know we're at such a crucial time in our politics um, and it's been a really, really challenging um I mean, how many months now? A good few months. Um, I'm uh, just qualified as a doctor and I've seen on the front line that coronavirus is is just absolutely affecting people's lives in, in terms of their health, but also their livelihoods and their financial situation. And um, it's such an acute time for the Labour movement to, to get behind everyone. Um, and stay strong. We know coronavirus wasn't inevitable. Pandemic planning should have been thought of and warnings were ignored by this government. Our public services are running on absolutely no slack to survive under the pressure. And that has been shown during this pandemic, especially on staffing levels. We've seen up to a third of NHS staff being off sick as they should be uh, with coronavirus or to prevent coronavirus spreading. And we just did not have enough doctors, enough nurses, enough NHS staff. And this has just highlighted how badly the Tories have handled our public services. We've also seen an outpouring of love for the NHS. And um, you could argue that the NHS being top of the agenda um, prevents the success of outwardly anti-NHS political movements, but that is not what's happening. We still have to fight for it as the left. The Even though it's, it's top of their political agenda, the Tories are still in government. It's the underhand policy of the Tories, short of the public actually being charged for healthcare, uh, which has benefited people having an apolitical nature to the NHS. And what we need to do as the left is say, the NHS is a piece of socialism. This is this is political. Coronavirus is political. This pandemic is political. That is the only way we can stop the right benefiting from people just clapping for the NHS and doing nothing else. Um, and in response to this, as the Labour Party, obviously I hold an internal position and I, I do think that the, the Labour Party in opposition needs to up their game. We previously held the blame for some of the problems in the NHS. Um, we lost the original values of the NHS when we were in government and we supported PFI. Um, Ken Clark said that um, Labour secretaries of state have got away with introducing private sector providers in the NHS on a scale which would have led the Labour Party onto the streets in demonstration if a Conservative government had ever tried it. And we must never, comrades, be in that space again. Of course, the Tories always handle the NHS worse than they have it in their hands, but a cross-party consensus developed when New Labour supported PFI, which allowed the process of privatisation and reorganisation to occur at an alarming alarming rate and without oppositions in the year after. All parts of our health service, from pharmaceuticals to supply chains, to educating staff and social care should be in the public domain, not run for profit. And social care, in my experience, is one of the most important issues in this. I'm currently working on a ward with, uh, with older people and a lot of them should be going into care homes, have got but can't and are sitting in hospital. They've got coronavirus in care homes and it's just the biggest issue that we need to fight for. And I really worry that our our policy on a national care service is going to get diluted because of the shadow ministers sitting in those positions. And I think as a left, we need to fight for that policy because it is one of the, the key issues of the day. And we, we've got nothing to challenge the Tories with, but the Tories have no policy on it. And we just need to be so much stronger in not just criticising the government, but having an alternative set out that people can organise and fight for in their workplaces and at a political level. If we want to save the NHS from the hands of private shareholders, it's Labour's duty to fight for it and refuse to turn to a time where we set the agenda for right-wing intervention in our precious public services. Um, and we know that not politicising the crisis will just fall into the hands of liberal solutions, which are paper thin. 
So the role of the labor movement must be centering the debate on opposing um, the disastrous situation of coronavirus, but crucially offering a positive vision for a future where the rules of the game will change um, and a, a plan of how um, a socialist government would address this crisis. Um, in recent years, we have transformed the political landscape of this country. You know, um, Jeremy Corbyn was uh, the leader of the Labour Party for four years, and that was not for nothing just because we are not in government. We've made anti-austerity the top of the political agenda and given people hope in distinguishing the key priorities of the major political parties for the first time. And we're facing rolling back on this now, as Ian mentioned. Uh, we want a Labour government, and when we're in a government, as Tony Benn said, we are not here just to manage capitalism, but to change society and to find its finer values. We need to use every minute in government to roll back anti-trade union laws, transform, transform and diversify our economy so it works for the many, and bring industries and production back into democratic control, not for profit. We can't act like the Tories are never going to get in again and attempt to reverse our progress as we have in the past. And the scale of the crisis that we face should determine our answer to the question of how radical a Labour government should be. Just a little shout out for Grace Blakely's recent article in Tribune where she's where she's highlighted this, that um, people are underestimating the scale of the crisis and also the scale of the solutions that we need to be promoting as a Labour Party to face the crisis. Um, I'll just finish on socialists must stay in the Labour Party now. I've heard anecdotal evidence of a lot of young members leaving. Um, and a lot of socialist members leaving. We've got to fight for our principles and take them into government. Don't let anyone say that you're not fighting for, for a Labour government or you don't care about that because you're a socialist. Um, but ultimately the Labour Party is what we make it. The trade union movement is what we make it. It's not a top down, it shouldn't be a top down organisation just telling us what to do. And you have to be in it to change it. And still fundamentally, I don't think we've reached the point um, yet, but still, I think the Labour Party is 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 the vehicle, the most important vehicle for social change in this country. And as we've seen, look at the Labour representatives, Labour MPs on this call, we can see that that fight and that and that passion and that socialism is still there. And that's why we all need to stay in it as members. And we must we must continue to fight for a Labour Party which um, which defends working class people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. Such a strong voice for young people in um, the Labour movement. I'm very envious. I think you're absolutely brilliant. Um, next up is um, Richard Burgon. Wouldn't it be brilliant if he was the deputy leader? Um, cheers, Richard. Thanks very much. Um, and it's been great to hear all the other speeches uh, today. Uh, and it's great to hear from Roger McKenzie from Unison. And I want to give my solidarity to striking Tower Hamlet workers. In fact, we had a striking Tower Hamlets worker at the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs uh, this week. Looking at the situation now, the UK has 65,000 excess deaths, making it one of the worst in the world. Tens of thousands of those deaths were completely avoidable, according to the top scientists. The results of government failure after government failure on testing and tracing, on PPE, on care homes and on lockdown. And those failings flow from us, as well as Brazil and the United States of America, having one of the most free market neoliberal systems in the world, leaving our society and our public services unprepared. We need to replace that system, not just tinker with that system, and that is a fundamental task of socialists. The public health crisis is set to develop into one of the deepest ever recessions. Experts are warning that UK unemployment rates could hit 15% if there is a second wave. That would mean approaching 5 million workers unemployed, and then of course there is underemployment as well. We can't fight the economic crisis until we tackle the public health crisis. So we need to keep up the calls for public health to be put first. So solidarity with our teaching unions. But we also need a national plan for growth and jobs, as we've heard. The record levels of state spending shouldn't be about shoring up a broken economic model that's failed people for the last decade and more. It should be about transforming our economy, dealing with the numerous crises we face, the crisis in wages, the crisis in public services, the climate crisis. We should be about creating a state that serves the people rather than a state that serves capital. The Tories don't want permanent state interventions and public ownership, but that's what we need to fight for. But state intervention in the interests of the 99% and public ownership of a modern democratic 
manner. We need to be fighting for a Green New Deal because we can't go into the climate crisis as badly prepared as we were for this crisis. We need to fight for state investment in modern infrastructure, in high wage tech and industrial industries to move our economy from low skill and low wage to high skill and high wage. We need to be fighting for investment to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the public services, for a record level of council housing, for a national care service. And of course, we need proper sick pay, rent cancellations and much more in the immediate term. We need to be about building a society of equals because the pandemic has shone a spotlight on the deep structural inequalities that scar our society. The Black Lives Matter movement has rightly pushed structural racism to the top of the agenda. Now is the time for real structural systematic change. The dismantling of all systematic inequality must be at the heart of how we rebuild better. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with women, with disabled people, with BAME communities and LGBT plus people who, as the economic recession bites, will face ever more reactionary attempts at scapegoating and attempts to divide and rule in our communities. The crisis has exposed inequalities, not only within society, but between societies. Poorer nations are facing even greater debts, which will mean cutting health services. Any global recession, make no mistake, will also see tensions rise. Already, Trump is more belligerent. Attacks on the World Health Organization are signs of a more unilateral and a beggar thy neighbor policy. Likewise, the increasing rhetoric against China. When we say people before profit, we must also mean peace and justice before profit. And over the coming months, that will mean ever greater solidarity with Palestine against the attempt to annex the West Bank. So in conclusion, comrades, as this crisis deepens, those radical ideas and policies in our last manifesto will be even more important and even more relevant. In fact, we will need to be even more radical. Some will deepen their attacks saying, that's why we lost but it wasn't why we lost. We lost because it became a Brexit election. There is only one way of responding to the health and economic and climate crisis. And that way, my friends, is called socialism. Brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. Absolutely, absolutely excellent. And um, next up, we have the fantastic Diane Abbott. Cheers, Diane. Diane, are you there? You might be on, um, you might. Yeah, Can great. you hear me now? Perfect, thank you. Very good. It's a real pleasure to attend this rally and to have heard some brilliant speeches. And I just wanted to say that one of the things they always say about Tories is they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And that has never been clearer that in the middle of this terrible coronavirus pandemic, it's a medical pandemic, it's a social pandemic, it's an economic pandemic, and we have the highest death rate in Europe. But how have the Tories contributed to the disastrous situation we're seeing? First of all, we're living with the consequences of their cuts to the NHS and local government, including public health. Sadly, neither the Conservatives or the Labour Party have come forward to say that social care should be properly publicly funded. Andy Burnham, I think, has campaigned on this issue. But at the moment, we are dealing with a shambolic private system of social care which relies on exploited care workers, many on zero hour contracts and agency workers. And the time has come to call for serious social care reform and bring it back into the public sector. One of the reasons that Test and Trace 
has been a shambles is that local authorities like Leicester could not get the information they needed about who tested positive because the government insisted on involving the private sector outsourced CERCO instead of working with GPs and the public health system. And the huge number of black, Asian and minority ethnic workers who have died, it's not because of comorbidity or that we all have diabetes, it's an economic and social phenomenon. Racism traps too many black people in low paid, vulnerable, insecure work, bus drivers, healthcare and social care. But we need to look at what's happening in the economy. Grace was very good on this subject. But I will only repeat what she said. There is a wave of unemployment coming. It will hit young people, women and black people worse. And Rishi Sunak may be a nice man, but what he's doing is bailing out banks and corporations, not ordinary workers or small business, the kind of small businesses we have here in Hackney and in the city of London. But what would Rishi Sunak know? He was a Goldman Sachs banker. He was a partner in a hedge fund. He's an investment banker. His wife is a daughter of a billionaire. Like the Tories as a whole, he knows nothing about the lives of ordinary people and will not be able to help them. We have to come forward with a proper cheek. So the Tories, people know the price of everything the value of nothing. And it's not going to be good enough just to be forensic. It's not going to be good enough to get the applause of Guardian columnists. We need a public inquiry into black people and coronavirus. We need to challenge the violent racism that has forced my friend and colleague Dawn Butler to close down her local office. We need to welcome the energy and enthusiasm of Black Lives Matter. Above all, we need to put jobs and living standards for everybody at the centre of our demands. We need to make sure we support the entire centre-left grassroots land slate in the forthcoming NEC elections. But we need to remember with all of this that the Labour Party remains the last and best hope of working people. And we should not just settle, as I say, for being told how forensic we are, or you know, to have guardian columnists being nice about, uh, nice about us. We must offer a real challenge to Tory failure. We must offer an alternative analysis. We must step up to the be pe- to be the people that working people can look to in this unprecedented international medical, social and economic pandemic. The community is looking to us, party members are looking to us. We must not fail. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely excellent. Um, yeah, we need we need more working class people to get involved. We can absolutely not abandon working class communities. They are 100 percent relying on us. Um, thank you so much. Next up, we've got John, John McDonnell. Thanks a lot. Can I just thank Matt Wilgress and all the organisers of today's event? This has been absolutely tremendous to get this number of people together both in terms of on Zoom, but on Facebook as well, following this just a, it demonstrates the, I think the concern that people have about the future of where we go from here as a party and as a left, but it also demonstrates absolute commitment to those people knowing that we're now entering into a new period of struggle. And the people before me have expressed their concerns about the economic situation. We have now, I think for our class facing one of the hardest periods that we've most probably seen since the 1980s. The job losses now are mounting on a daily basis. I'll just, let me just run through a few because this is where we need to be absolutely alongside people. Over the last fortnight, we've had Rolls-Royce announce 9,000 job losses, Centrica 5,000, Swissport 4,000, and we've seen Jaguar at 1,100, Bentley 1,000, <clears throat> Aston Martin 1,000. HSBC have announced 35,000 job cuts globally. Many of those will appear here. Boots and John Lewis, 5,300. It just goes on and on. And within 
a fortnight, we lost nearly 100,000 jobs. In my own constituency, we've just had BA, as people know, announce 12,000 jobs lost fortnight ago. But also, we're also seeing this new phenomenon, and Ian Lavery made reference to it, and others of, as well, which is we're seeing companies like BA and appallingly labor councils like Tower Hamlets actually use the, use the crisis to cut wages and undermine conditions. What BA are doing, in addition to 12,000 redundancies, they're dismissing all their staff and seeking to re-employ them on lower wages and worse terms and conditions of employment. You'd expect that from a company like BA because it's brutal and is managed by Willie Walsh, who, to be frank, um, is one of the outriders for neoliberalism. But what you wouldn't expect it to be pursued by a Labour council. That's why, exactly as Ian and others have said today, let's send absolute solidarity to the strikers at Tower Hamlets. Um, as it, Richard said, we had one of the strikers along to the Socialist Campaign Group, and we had one of the Labour councillors who's standing up against the Mayor John Biggs, who's forcing these policies through. When there are struggles like this in this coming period, and there will be, because people facing this level of job cuts are going to start fighting back, we've got to be alongside them on every occasion. So I also want to send my solidarity to the IWGB, who are campaigning against the job cuts against couriers working for Sonic and the English company called the Doctors Laboratory. What happened there is that we, we supported a strike last year, which was successful. So now the company has come back using the excuse, using the, the guise of the crisis, and are now sacking couriers. And it's no coincidence that the people they're sacking are the trade union representatives who were effective in winning the dispute last year. This is the nature of, well, the phase that capitalism in our country and elsewhere is going through. So we know our duty. It's exactly as Ian and Richard and Diane and others have said, our duty is to support those who are willing to fight back. And that's the role of a Labour MP, it's the role of a Labour Party member, and it's the role of the Labour Party leadership as well. Now, there may well be forms of industrial action, there may well be forms of demonstrations, occupations or whatever, we support them. We will be alongside them. When people plant the flag and want to fight back, we'll be alongside them. That's the whole purpose of our movement. And it's the lesson learned over a century of the Labour Party and over two and a half centuries of the formation of the trade union movement in, in this country. But alongside that is the point that's been made as well. Um, we've got to make sure we support those people who are losing their jobs, but also those also have been without pay or full pay for such a long period of time. So we're going to see, for example, we've been meeting with the Renters' Union and with ACOR, and we will see now, once the ban on evictions is, is lifted, we will see mass evictions unless we stand firm against them, and unless we force through Parliament again a further restrictions on the evictions taking place. I can't see the Tories upholding that. I think they'll let the landlords run riot, and we'll be seeing people losing the roof over their heads. Again, what we need to be doing is campaigning alongside the renters, not just to end evictions, but also to wipe out the debt that they've incurred as a result of this pandemic. And I say also, you know, we've got to really have a conversation about landlordism in this country. I don't see why someone should be a landlord anymore. I think what we should be doing is looking at how we can end certainly mass landlordism, the ownership of large numbers of properties, simply to make profit rather than to provide people with a decent home. Again, it opens up the opportunities for much more radical change than maybe we've thought of in, in the past. Which leads me on to really our second role. Of course, we, as the recession hits, we've got to be there supporting people. But also we've got to recognize there's large numbers of people now who will now be thrown onto benefits, many of whom have never experienced the benefit system before. That means part of our campaigning has got to be about an uplift in benefits and financial support for individuals and families. And again, what we've been doing, we've got to do, is making sure we do all the representations we possibly can, because the sanctions are now coming back. And you can imagine what will happen now when people are chasing jobs, so few jobs, so many people unemployed. 
you can imagine the sort of pressure and stress that they'll be under and the type unfortunately of mental health problems that people experience as a result of that so again what we've got to do now is part along the campaign for jobs the campaign for protect people in work protecting wages and conditions is also making sure that we call for radical change with our social security system so people are properly supported Finally, the next issue is this. Yes, in all those campaigning that we do, we need to be at the forefront of this. That's the role of the Labour Party. But also we've got to start providing the vision of the sort of society that we now want to create. There's been a slogan used, build back better. I don't want to go back. I want to claim a new future. I want a new society. I want a new economy. And from the left now, we've got to start looking at what that would look like. Yes, we had the 17 and 2019 manifestos, but times have changed. We need to be much more radical than that. And I think people are up for that. The pandemic has taught people that actually austerity has got to end. The toys will tie austerity by stealth. We've got to monitor that and attack it. But in addition to that, people have been, you can't, this isn't about individualism and more. There are collective solutions. The state has a role to play. We need control over your working lives as well as in your communities. That means trade union rights. All of that we need to put, put forward, I think, now and develop an alternative economic strategy for this coming period. And in that way, I think we'll be able to inspire people and we'll be able to create a climate of opinion that will secure a Labour government at the next election, but a Labour government that is also a socialist government. And that's what our objective is. Solidarity, brothers and sisters. John, thank you so much. And um, particularly when you mentioned about housing, yeah, why is it okay to be a landlord? Why is it okay to own a second home when my family and friends are spending two thirds of their wages on rent? It's absolutely outrageous. And we can't be afraid of this. We absolutely have to be on the side of renters. We, we really do. Um, and, and next up is Jeremy Corbyn. But I just want to thank everybody so much for participating. We know that we have really important battles ahead. And also we know just how important our campaigning for people to be put before profit is and how essential events like this are to build understanding. So please get involved with campaigns on the vital issues that have been discussed today and please also donate on the link provided and sign the statement for a people's post pandemic plan. We must keep working together to insist there is no return to business as usual because when it comes to um, the economy and politics and not only uh, for us to argue that a better world is possible, but we need to win that better world. Um, so now I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to our final speaker, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, guys. Solidarity. Laura, thank you very much for that introduction, for your brilliant chairing of today's event and your fantastic work campaigning in Harlow. And it's always was a pleasure to campaign alongside you. And I will be again wherever you stand, whatever you do, because you've done an absolutely brilliant job there. A big thank you also to Matt for all the organising that's gone into the Arise um, events, plus all the people that are working with and supporting Matt and all the other speakers today. I've managed to listen to most of it this afternoon. But like Ian Lavery, I would be much happier to be at Durham this afternoon. I go to Durham pretty well every year, and it's an amazing event, an amazing uh, expression of solidarity from the former mining communities. And the principle and that spirit of the mining communities is there in all the campaigns that come to Durham. And so I think the lesson there is community organizing in a real sense works. Community organizing in a real sense works and educates, enthuses and empowers people. And that surely is what it has to be about. I'm obviously very sad at the general election result that we got. And it was a devastating night on December the 12th when the results came in. And uh, whilst we did get over 10 million votes, we didn't gain the seats we needed in order to form a Labour government. All through that campaign, we put forward a very effective manifesto, cautious in some respects, but a manifesto that was about redistributing power and wealth within our society. And all those ideas individually were actually very popular, all of them housing, environment, education, health, social care, broadband, 
all the issues that we put forward were very, very popular. But for five years, we had unremitting attacks on us from the mainstream media. The analysis done of the 2019 campaign by a number of very reputable people in a number of our colleges and universities shows that in the last week of the campaign, 97% of media coverage was negative or hostile to Labour. Individuals were absolutely pilloried. Those people that have been on this call this afternoon and many others, Dawn, Diane, John, Richard, myself and others, absolutely brutally treated by the media. Ian Lavery pilloried by the Sunday Times at various moments in the past few years and so on. And so it shows to me the importance of communicating an effective message all the time to our friends and to our supporters and to our potential supporters. The form of communication we're doing today, Zoom, is a way of bypassing the medium of the billionaire owned press. It is a way of communicating directly with people. But there's actually no substitute for being out there at the workplace, at the bus station, at the train station, at the factory gates, wherever else it happens to be, doing that campaigning work and that discussion with people. And the points that John just made about all the disputes that are coming up are so important. So don't let anybody trash the 2019 manifesto. So when we go into policy reviews in the party, let's build on what we achieved, on what John achieved in promoting an economic strategy, which didn't accept austerity or the management of the economy, sought to transform the economy. The total change that Diane brought about in home affairs policy and strategy, what she achieved in having a sensible, serious conversation about the value of those people that have made their homes in this country and made such an incredible contribution. And the way that she, more than anybody else almost, in 2014, called out Theresa May on the Windrush scandal that was coming. It wasn't a surprise to any of us because Diane had already analyzed exactly what was gonna happen with the hostile environment that was being created. And so we built that campaign and we built that sense of unity in what we were doing. And so build on that. I've got just beside me here, an example of one of the things we did, GB Rail the proposals developed by um, Andy MacDonald as uh, Shadow Transport Secretary for a fully publicly owned and publicly run rail system in this country. I was condemned for wanting to spend substantial amounts of money on investment in housing, investment in education, investment in health, investment in a green industrial revolution to create the good quality jobs, well-paid, skilled jobs for the future, to unleash what is there in all of our young people, their creative endeavors and imagination through the pupil arts premium, to put the resources where they're needed in those communities whose jobs and industries were destroyed on the altar of monetarism under Margaret Thatcher from 1979 onwards and actually haven't seen a return yet to all uh, that they need. So I was condemned by that. I remember on the next podium to Boris Johnson during the uh, debates we held in Sheffield and the other one in Maidstone, he said, we can't afford any of that stuff. You're gonna spend far too much money. Well, I think um, the crisis has shown that when uh, even Tories need the money, they find it. We were prepared to find that money to invest in what people need. But that investment would have been fair. That investment would have been where it was needed. And what we now see through the corona crisis is a number of things. One, that um, it's not even. It affects the poorest and most vulnerable the worst. It's not something that is going to simply go away. 
the ideas that um, Boris Johnson and others were lecturing myself and John Ashworth and others about called herd immunity, a nonsense, just absolute nonsense, um, a eugenics theory. Um, there has to be an effective health service. The World Health Organization warned of the corona crisis early in January. Boris Johnson chose to ignore those warnings. And they pointed out that countries that didn't have a universal health service would be the most vulnerable. Look at the relative death rates and infection rates around the world and you'll see exactly what I mean by that. And now you look at the analysis of who has been affected by the corona lockdown. The poorest people in the poorest places in the largest families have suffered the most. You might say Kelsa Prees, it's a Tory government. Well, it's not right. It's simply not right. And I suspect many people are going to be threatened with job loss when the furlough scheme comes to an end. If we're putting money into the private sector, I don't particularly have a problem with public money going in to defend jobs. In fact, I absolutely support that. It's exactly what John McDonnell was demanding of the government when uh, the corona crisis was uh, uh, growing very fast in February and March. It's exactly the points he was making. Um, but if we're putting money in to sustain large private sector companies, then that must also be accompanied by a public stake in those companies so that we, the public, get a benefit from those companies when better times begin to come. And so I think we need to recognise that our NHS has only survived through this crisis because of the principle behind the NHS and because of the incredible levels of dedication of all workers within the NHS. And at last, a realisation that people that various Home Secretaries have described as unskilled cleaners are pretty important when you need a clean hospital, a clean bus, a clean train, a clean school. Let's start treating all workers with the respect that they deserve and recognise that those BAME communities that work so hard within the NHS and care and local government and so on have disproportionately suffered and died because of the corona crisis. The inequalities are writ large in everything. A couple of other points I just want to make are these. There is another global crisis, and that's the environmental crisis around the world. It's not going to go away. It's going to intensify. It's not just about CO2 emissions and global warming. It's also about destruction of um, our biodiversity. It's also about the pollution of rivers, seas and skies. Some people during the lockdown for the first time breathe clean air. For the first time, children growing up in New Delhi actually saw the beauty of many of the buildings there. The same applied in many other big cities around the world. We've got to clean up our environment. I was looking forward to leading a government that would go to COP26 with a determination to get to net zero by 2030. That's what Becky Long Bailey was working for. That's what we were all working for. So we make those demands anyway, whether we're in government or not in government. We mount those campaigns anyway, and we do them with other people as well. And so our program of investment in the economy, of social justice, of recognizing the ability that's there in all people was very empowering. Power comes from where you are and what you're prepared to do. So when people stand up to defend their jobs, we go alongside them. When people stand up to demand new industries, new jobs, a cleaner society, we're with them on that. It's how we campaign on things. But it's also what we do in solidarity with each other. I've been involved in no end of Zoom calls. In fact, um, this room has been the basis of most of the meetings I've done over the past few months. And some of them have been absolutely enormous. I did a Zoom conference call with Arundhati Roy from India, and we had people on from all over the world. Hundreds of thousands watched it. I did a similar discussion with Dilma Rousseff, the former president of Brazil, about environment and social justice and many other issues. We had, again, 
a very, very large number of people on. We can now relate to each other because we're now used to doing it this way. After Corona crisis means that we go back to having meetings and rallies and demonstrations, let's not forget that these systems are there and enable us to talk to people from all over the world in a much simpler way. And so international solidarity, and I was proud to put this in the manifesto, meant that we would go into government with a manifesto commitment that was about a foreign policy based on human rights, based on democracy, based on peace, and that we would raise all those issues. The Tories claim that they were in favour of human rights and were going to take stern action against individuals who commit human rights abuse. I remember that very well because uh, whilst uh, a number of us were demonstrating outside General Pinochet's house while he was under house arrest in Britain, Margaret Thatcher was inside visiting him. Um, the Tory solidarity with the dictators of Latin America goes back a very long way. And so, yes, of course, there should be sanctions taken against individual abusers of human rights. And the one great success of the Pinochet campaign was a declaration by the British courts that where uh, crimes against humanity are concerned, the jurisdiction is universal. I agree with that and support that. But you can't be taken seriously on human rights if the following day you decide to resume arms sales to Saudi Arabia with its appalling human rights record and the war in Yemen, which has made the people of Yemen the most desperate and poorest on the face of the whole earth at the present time. Any more than you can pass by on the other side for the massive refugee flows that have come to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Bangladesh, and other places because of human rights abuse. Think for the Rohingya people, more than a million in refugee camps in Cox's Bazaar at the present time. So we have to stand up for those rights as well. And we will continue to do that. And oppose the Trump plan for the annexation of the West Bank by the Israeli government, which is what he's proposing at the present time. I did um, the last meeting of um, Palestine conference last Sunday on this. And again, we had a huge global audience. And so when we engaged in campaigns in international solidarity, they're part and parcel of the same things that we're doing here. Because the global corporations that are being empowered and funded by this Tory government are doing the same things in other countries. So those global movements are very important. So we work with our friends in the USA and other countries in order to challenge that power. Socialism is about empowering people, is about real democracy where everyone has that voice and that ability to take part in decision making. And it's not just about elections, it's about what you do between elections, it's about how you campaign to achieve things. Those that founded our movement in 18th, 19th century, they didn't actually ever thought they'd be in office they were determined to change their communities. Ian was talking earlier about the spirit of the mining communities in Durham. Those organized communities that set up their community centers, their libraries, their education program, empowered working class people to achieve change in those communities. The National Health Service is based on what happened in Tredegar in the 19th and 20th century. And so, Arise has given us the chance all to talk and listen to each other, and it's been absolutely fascinating. But we've got to stick together, campaign together with all those principles that brought us together. I want to say thank you to everyone for the personal friendship and support they gave me during the past five years. But I haven't gone away, I'm around. And I'm going to be around campaigning alongside everybody else, because that is what we do. But it's also important that we stick together and campaign together. So when the policy reviews come along and they've got to be, the submissions have to be in by the 20th of July, I'm proud of what we had in our manifesto. I'm proud of the policy changes that we achieved. Let's not just defend those, let's take them a bit further. 
we develop the green industrial revolution a long way. It can go much further. We need to develop much further the principles behind the National Education Service, education as a right, not a privilege. We need to end any element of privatization within the National Health Service, including ending the disastrous private finance initiative programs and bring the social care sector into the public sector. And of course, in housing regulate and control the private rented sector, invest in council housing, invest in the principle that everyone deserves somewhere decent to live. Having somewhere decent to live is a pretty basic principle and we can achieve it. So thank you everyone for being on this call. Thank you everyone for all the work you do. And together, we are very strong and it's about bread and roses too. So it is about our cultural expression as well. So work together, be strong together, but above all, stand in solidarity with those that are suffering the most. That way, we'll defeat the races who want to divide, divide us. And we stand in solidarity in the memory, not just of George Floyd, but all those others that have been killed by racism around the world. So. We learn our history as well, and history, properly learned, can empower us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody. I think that's it. Cheers.